So thank you for being here tonight. And this is a, a moment that we really uh, enjoy. We call it uh, Stump the Cantor. So whatever questions you have, we'll take the cards and maybe Beth can help us. Thank you for being here too, Beth. And we're going to come down. And don't you think it's called Stump the Senior Rabbi? Stump the Cantor. <laughs> I actually sure think that's what this game is. If you'd, like to, play, ask if the you'd rabbi. like to play Stump the Associate <laughs> Rabbi, we can do that too. But uh, we're, we're, we, we love engaging with, with individuals like this, so feel free to ask anything. We may not get to all the questions. Uh, I can take them too if you have some cards here for us. We'll shuffle them so that we won't know. Who came up with what? They're all coming up. Got one there? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, hi. Thank you. Okay, now I can really shuffle many. I won't remember which one is the folded one. <laughs> what? <laughs> a rabbi supposed to lie. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. I'm, I'm going to get to shuffle these. So you are welcome if you think of another one to, to hold up a card and, or, and we'll ask. We'll Thank see how many guys. we have time for. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's see. I saw just one that came in that said Cantor on it. So I'm going to oh, give that okay. to you. I Thank haven't you. had a chance Exciting. to read. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Give you one, give me one, we'll take a look. And whoever comes up with an answer first, just hit your buzzer and we will. Okay. You got one? I do, but I don't have an answer yet. <laughs> this one's hard. Okay, then I'm gonna jump in. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna jump in. Ooh. Um, well, okay, I'll so have... this one says, uh, who is your favorite cantor? And why? Um, Cantor Con. No, I'm just. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, um, believe it or not, there are there are I think just under 900 of us in North America. So it it sounds like a really huge group, but it's really not. There there, are, well, under 900 of us, uh, and and we're pretty close. A lot of us we all know each other, and and we we understand one another's lives in a really particular way. Um, but I was ordained in 2013 with the very first group of, there were 10 of us and we were all women. Um, and, uh, and really it, it became a sisterhood and we do have a, a text string that has been going for, God, 15, 12 years at this point. Um, but uh, so I would say my favorite cantors are probably my, my sisters, like any sisterhood. We, we drive each other nuts and we're particularly close. So we were able to do a 10 year reunion concert a couple of years ago, yeah. which was really special in Philadelphia. Uh, and then uh, what, what piece in particular do I love? Um, I will tell you that music is especially meaningful to me when I feel like it reflects the text. So, um, you know, a really good melody does not a prayer make, in my opinion. Uh, and so I'm so glad you asked because on Yom Kippur morning, you will hear, thank you, a, um, so a, setting, of, a setting of Sim Shalom by Max Janowski that is, um, that is just haunting and big. And it makes me think of this whole idea of a prayer for peace in a much more demanding way. So that's my answer. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, so this question, the one that I said was hard, is what do you want to give up in 5785? So I don't, I've been thinking about that. I mean, the first thing that came to mind was my addiction to chai tea lattes. <laughs> but I really love chai tea lattes, so I really don't want to give them up. <laughs> um, so um, I'm really still thinking about that. I think one thing I would like to do less, I will answer, um, is we get really fixated on the news right now and, you know, fixated on every poll and listen to all these different podcasts about politics. And I don't think that's good for my mental health so or any of our mental health necessarily. So I think uh, focusing more on those things that are helpful and relaxing and, like, add to my life in positive ways and letting go of some of the things uh, that cause more stress for my life. 
Okay. Um, I got a very challenging one as well. What is your favorite color? <laughs> and, wait a minute, there's an and to that. Why? <laughs> and what do, and this is for y'all, so I assume mm -hmm. that means all three of us. Um, the best way to make the High Holy Days a meaningful experience outside of services. So mm -hmm. I'm going to take the first one, you answer the second one. Okay. <laughs> My favorite color is green. I like nature. I like the point. I like the spot where the blue sky meets the green trees. Just that one spot. I'll answer the second one too because I can't help myself. Um, the best way to make the High Holy Days a meaningful experience outside of services. You know, I'll answer the, this way. During COVID, uh, there were certain there were certain pieces that were very very challenging, of course, for all of us. But there were also these really interesting moments to make meaning that I don't know that we'll ever have again. And I think in particular about the moment when leading up to those first high holy days, we face this challenge of like, okay, well, so people are going to be in their homes and they're going to be hopefully tuning in. We were in this space and it was empty. Uh, Pete Smith Heisler, our executive director, reminds me that his first high holidays, he was the only one in yeah. this space. Mm -hmm. And there was a big TV camera, and it was just not at all what we had, had you know, trained for. Let's just put it that way. Um, but we realized that we wanted to offer our congregation a way to make this meaningful in their home. So aside from just watching something on the screen, we offered this really interesting program where we talked about making a sacred space in your own home or wherever you were. There were times when, especially during COVID, when we would be offering a class or something and somebody would be taking a walk while they were on the Zoom call with us and we would like watch. I remember one who was, who was a little bit kind and he turned his phone this direction so he could hear us, but what we were seeing was his walk through the woods um, while we were, um, while we were learning together. I think that there are ways to, that, to make this very meaningful that have nothing to do with sitting in the pews. It's about what you do during these 10 days, especially. So number one, I would say, what is sacred in your life? Is it taking a walk? Is it actually taking the words of the prayer book and trying to integrate them into your life? Is there a way that you want to maybe even, uh, maybe you take a picture of one of the prayers that, that strikes you tonight even, and you sit with it during the 10 days. Maybe you put it up somewhere so that you're really thinking about it. This prayer book, if it's anything, it is dense. There is so much in this prayer book, and whether we're doing a reading on the left or a reading on the right, or there are notes on the bottom, and all of it is literally thousands of years of wisdom that has emerged in this book that we're going to kind of flip through and we're going to skip some pages and we're not really going to get to the whole thing. So that's the first part. What, what can you do on your own that's going to make these days meaningful? And I don't think it needs to be in this space. The other thing I would say, of course, is that the 10 days of repentance, that's about this very personal inner work of actually making contact with the people in your lives with whom you have tension and conflict, actually trying to make repair happen. And without that step, I actually don't know that what we do in this room means very much at all. So I would argue that that's the two, two suggestions I would give. Do y'all have anything? <laughs> What's your well, favorite color? <laughs> Uh, my favorite color is pink, especially, especially like We know this <laughs> about Rabbi <laughs> Jordana. A fuchsia. I'm not wearing any right now, but I do wear a lot of fuchsia and like fuchsia. Um, I think for me, each High Holy Day, certain things really hit me. And um, especially with everything that's happening in the Middle East right now, the prayers for peace this year, I'm finding very powerful and very meaningful. Um, and so I think I also encourage you when you're in this space to really focus in on some of those prayers that are especially hitting home to you. Um, but very similar to what Rabbi Brett um, just said, I would say it's really also about doing that work and actually apologizing and not to knock it, but I know some people just like put on Facebook, like, hey, if I've wronged you in the past year, I'm sorry. 
but I don't think, that, I think that follows like the letter of the law, not the actual intention. I don't think you can apologize to a thousand people in one fell swoop. It is really, truly sitting down with someone and saying, I'm sorry, and opening up a conversation about what you can do better. And when you do that, that I think is what makes these days really powerful and really meaningful and important. Um, I think that I get, um, I get a bit more of what I'm gonna call a, an on-ramp to the holidays because I start choir rehearsals like months ago. So I feel like I've been sitting with the music and the cue sheets for, for so long um, that, that for me, uh, the minute the choir's together and I just start hearing ba 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 ba, it starts to feel real. Um, personally, what I do uh, is I actually come into the cavernous empty space always uh, the morning of Erev Rosh Hashanah and uh, when usually things are hustling and bustling in the office but people aren't really around in this space and I always, always take a moment just to myself to kind of understand. Um, it, I, I think humility is like the most important thing that we can bring to the table in this moment and, um, and so I try to, try to embody that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, and my favorite color. I, I'm, I'm a purple person. I really am. Yep. Um, did you answer one? Um, I did, but I can start. Okay. My next one is, why did you, how did you know you wanted to become a rabbi slash cantor? Um, and as some of you know, I grew up in a very Jewish home. You know, my mom worked for the URJ for literally like 30 years, and my dad is a judge, so he had very Jewish values. It was just kind of always like the backdrop of my life. I was you know, this is not going to be surprising. I was a youth group kid. I was a camp kid. The Jewish holidays were huge in my house. We always had people over for, for Shabbat and all the high holy days. Literally, I've been calling my mom the past couple of weeks, and she's like, oh, I'm really busy. I'm baking right now. <laughs> like, I can't talk to you. And I'm like, I get it. Believe me. Um, but still, to this day, my parents have just tons and tons of people over. We don't have a large actual biological family, but we have this enormous kind of chosen family of people who've been uh, literally celebrating the holidays with my family for, for over 50 years. Um, so it was just always this backdrop of my life. And I went to Kutz Camp, the URJ Kutz Camp in Warwick, New York when I was 16. Um, and I remember sitting around and we're talking about and the lake and we're sitting in this pagoda and we're talking about God and I'm like, this is what I wanna do. This is what I wanna keep doing with my life. And it was that spark. And, then, like, my path kind of meandered. I went to college. I majored in other things and, you know, went to Scotland and got a first master's degree and blah, blah, blah. But really, it was on, um, on our honeymoon that my husband, Luke, said to me, he's like, this is what you keep talking about. This is what you want to do. You know, go learn your Hebrew and take the GRE and, and go to rabbinic school. And so... Um, his blessing in this role meant so much to me because this, this role has a huge impact on his life and my kid's life and the fact that he was uh, supportive of it uh, really meant the, meant the world to me. So uh, that is the long, uh, the short version of the story of how I got here. Okay. Um, why don't we use the organ anymore? So I, I, have, uh, I, I have so much, so much to say about this. I will tell you, I'll tell you. Um, so the first thing uh, I wanna share is that I, am, I love to sing, I do, but I am much more of a music director. Those of you who know me know that I've, I've some of you may know that I've got a, a background in, um, in choral and orchestral conducting, that that's what I do, and, and I have always heard um, harmonically. I hear in layers and I know exactly what things need to sound like and, and what voice is missing at what time, whether that's an instrument or, or a, a certain color. I kind of think of it like a, a painter looking at a canvas, just knowing what needs to be there. Um, I will share that uh, first and foremost, you should know that music in uh, the reform movement is a pendulum. It's a pendulum that swings. And throughout the 80s, it swung very, very hard towards camp music, which uh, introduced the guitar and did away with the organ and more classical music. The organ is not an improvisatory instrument, and most of our music is improvisatory. What do I mean by that? 99% um, of what you heard this evening is Matt's creation. He invents it all. It's not written on the page. He has chords written down, and he makes it up, and often, the chords he has written down are not even the chords we're doing because we're doing it in a totally different key, which is why I auditioned 27 accompanists before we found Matt, right? So you should know that, that it, is, it, is, it is an art form 
that and and if you if you come back next week and we do any of the same settings it's going to sound completely different because every time we sit down that's what it is now the organ is a classical instrument um, the piano is as well but the organ is not improvisatory much like a violin you cannot simply look at a chord chart and just invent what you want on an organ the other thing i'll say is that i absolutely love the organ in the right setting. So if you have ever been to Trinity, if you've ever been to Trinity Episcopal Church, there is a stunning pipe organ in a stone um, enclosed building with, with stained glass windows and it's, it's glorious. It's some of the best Bach I've ever heard in my life. I'm partial to Michael playing it. Um, it's pretty beautiful. And also um, our instrument is an electronic instrument uh, much like we have an electronic keyboard down the hall that we could be using. It's a wonderful instrument, and it, it serves the purpose that it does. Sometimes on the high holidays, Michael will play um, in the afternoon for people to listen to, but it is not this, this setting, um, as a music director, is not the setting for, we, we don't have a pipe organ. I think that's, that's a really important thing to state, that we don't have a pipe organ. So... Um, it's, it's funny because those of you who, when I said, you know, in the 80s, the music kind of swung towards the camp movement, there were some of you who kind of, you know, shifted a little bit, and there were others who got super excited. <laughs> and so what I want you to know is that um, music is a glorious pendulum that swings back and forth, and I think it's so important to find space for all of it. Um, I do intentionally, IHC Music, we have concerts every year that we actually host at Trinity so that we can use that glorious instrument in a space conducive to it. So, um, yeah, that's my, that's my answer. I will tell you that when I first started at um, Temple Emanuel of Edison, New Jersey, there was an organ in the corner that was broken. And so the rabbi said to me, we have to figure out how to donate this. We have to get rid of it. And I, a brand new cantor, Googled where to donate an organ. You should not do that. <laughs> that is not, that is not, what comes up is not what you're thinking of. Yeah, so it's not smart. Yeah, that's a true story. Yeah. Wow. So. Well, I can just <laughs> Not smart. give Matt a shout out uh, that uh, one thing I really love so much about leading here with Matt is he's truly, I feel like, a partner in leading services with us and really Absolutely. helps us set the mood and the tone and really understand sometimes what we say, um, even when we don't necessarily understand it properly ourselves, but you always pick up the mood and that is so appreciated and a real talent. Um, I'm going to jump in with this question. Um, so there's two versions of it. So someone wrote, talk election hmm. and then it, it does also say let aviva answer all <laughs> well let she can aviva be our expert on the all. election being canadian yeah I... but i'm going to take it first though with some churches getting political do you sometimes feel it necessary to get political too do religious mores and ethics mean anything anymore so i will argue that there's a huge difference between talking about politics and being political. And I think that if we do our job well, that we are always being political. That's very different than from saying we're gonna talk about politics <coughs> because politics is so often local. You know, do we wanna have a conversation in our congregation about which candidate to vote for in the next election? No, we actually are not allowed legally to do that. But are we going to have a conversation, many conversations in our congregation about the ethics and the values behind those decisions? What is it that is on the ballot right now, even nationally and locally too? So for example, is there a Jewish perspective on the issue of immigration? Yes. Is there a Jewish perspective? And I'm not talking about reform, conservative, orthodox. I'm talking about a Jewish perspective. We, all of those denominations that I just mentioned, share the same 
uh, rabbinic texts. We are all under the umbrella of rabbinic Judaism, which means that the conversations that have gone on for literally 2,000 years about those kinds of issues, immigration, end of life, beginning of life, issues like when does life begin, how are you allowed to take a, an active uh, participation in, in ending your life, all of those kinds of questions, Judaism has lots to say about it. This is why we're getting involved every year in what's happening in our legislature. This is why we're getting involved every year in advocating for Jewish values and speaking out when it's appropriate to do so. Um, we have an entire wing of our Jewish community locally, and it's in most Jewish communities, called the Jewish Community Relations Council, the JCRC, and they are directly involved in being political. So um, is there a place for those politics, those, that political conversation on the bima? Um, the truth is that some rabbis feel that they would never do that on the bima. Um, I know rabbis in, in our community who feel that way. Um, I don't feel that way. Um, I remember somebody who I had given a high holiday sermon about immigration several years ago, and he came up to me and said, um, you know, can't you just talk about the Torah? <laughs> and I said to him, have you read the Torah? <laughs> because it's all about immigration. It's, it is entirely a story about immigration. Uh, it has a lot to say about immigration. Um, so I, that is truly how I feel. Yes, of course there is a place for it. Am I going to talk election? No, I am not going to do that. But by, in a bipartisan way to say that there are clear ethics and values that should guide us in our decision-making process. And those are Jewish ethics and values that we will talk about and continue to talk about here. But we um, will encourage all of you to go out and vote. Or be poll workers. And voting is one of them. You know, the, you know, the, the act of voting itself or being a poll worker is a, a huge... I, I am very proud that Rabbi Chernow Reader has overseen this uh, for our congregation and that we have been much more visible and much more active this year in this election than we have in the past. That's, that's a huge uh, statement. And that has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with being engaged in the political system. I will add one thing to that, and that is... Well, it um, says let Aviva answer oh, all. Well, so <laughs> let me answer all I, of it. Go Great. ahead. Um, I, I'm going to say that um, I believe that where we as a movement, the Union for Reform Judaism, um, have a chance to be better is that it is our job, and it must be our job, to be clergy and to be a movement for all. And what I mean by that is that um, oftentimes, and I experienced this in particular on the coast, it can be very easy to, to find yourself in a political vacuum, to preach to the choir, as it were. Um, and it is exceptionally important to each and every one of us that everyone feel comfortable walking through that door and sitting in these pews, regardless of political affiliation. And so I think that, um, that we need to be better at being a movement for all. Um, and I think that, uh, that we uh, often talk about the importance of acceptance and inclusion and tolerance and oftentimes have the hardest time accepting those with differing opinions. Um, and now more than ever, I, I think Jews have learned that we ought not to be divided. So. Um, so that's, that's my, my stump speech. You know, just just yeah. one little add-on piece to this, and then I want to get to another question. Sure. But uh, as, a, as a sort of add-on to that, some, uh, someone wrote, um, what sermon would get you fired? <laughs> I don't think you should give it whatever it is. <laughs> well, I, have a, I, I, I think I have an answer for this question. I don't know if you, if you do. But for me, um, the, the, the biggest frustration about uh, our work, and, and, and since COVID, I feel like this is a lot, uh, a lot worse, is that um, I do not find a, an online presence to be a spiritually fulfilling piece of the work. Now, if you're here tonight joining us, 
we're, gr- we're glad that you're participating, but it's not the same as being here in person and being able to share this experience in a personal way. Um, I would give a sermon that says, uh, you got to show up. You got to show up. Everyone, everyone has to show up. And, and now I'm really, I really am speaking to the choir because you're all here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I like to point out sometimes that the, even the parking lot couldn't really take it. If our entire congregation showed up every Friday night, we don't have enough space for everybody. Uh, we are already admitting that there is a large percentage of the population of the congregation that is not going to be here on Friday night. It's not going to come for classes. They're not going to come. And that's, that's my frustration. The sermon I would love to give is to say, if you are not showing up, and I don't mean every single class and every single week, but if you're not showing up, you're not cutting it. That's what I would, would want to say. And I think it would probably get me fired if I did it well. <laughs> I think my, right. my answer to that question is I really hope I don't find out. <laughs> I don't find out. <laughs> Uh, this question is, after your bar or bat mitzvah, are you technically an adult or are you still reaching adulthood? Mm. So I think that technically, yes, you are an adult, but with a caveat, we are all still always adulting and reaching adulthood and hopefully always learning and growing. You know, sometimes I'll work with a conversion student or someone new to Judaism and there's like, there's still so much to learn. I'm just like, well, yeah, there is. Like, I've been to rabbinic school. I've been Jewish my whole life. I've always been interested in this and there's still so much for me to learn. So I hope we all take this attitude to to Judaism that there's more to learn, there's more to grow, there's more ways we can engage in it. Um, So that is my answer. Okay, so we'll just do this as maybe a final one, unless you have more. So this is, uh, I think, a really good one. Um, What can we do as individuals who, I hope that it wasn't my sermon on showing up. (laughs) Just kidding. It's good to see you. All right, what can we do as individuals who feel frustrated by uh, anti-Zionist Activity, oh, anti scientist activity in our community uh, in the year since October 7th. For instance, tomorrow there's a rally to celebrate a year of resistance. Mm. It's being held, which seems more like a celebration of death. So um, I have been sent a number of different pieces from our college students and family members from around the country that there is a tremendous amount of activity that it's being planned. There was something I saw that's actually they're trying to kind of overwhelm the city of New York on the 7th and celebrate uh, these attacks on Israel that happened a year ago. I really believe that, uh, that most participants in those, act- in those activities are misguided. They're not really understanding what it is that they're coming to celebrate. Um, and I also w- hope that they'll all of them read my sermon from Erev Rosh Hashanah. It probably won't happen, but I can hope. I can wish. Um, and what I think we can all do is make sure that when there's a rally that supports the positions that we hold, that we show up to those too. So actually, right here in our space on the 7th, we're holding the community rally in support of Israel. Um, We already have, um, I mean, hundreds of people who have signed up. Uh, Please, if you want to come, come early. If you want to be anywhere close to the front, because I think we'll go all the way back to the to the wall um, with probably a thousand or twelve hundred people here in the in the space Um, the press will be here we're gonna try to make a statement that you know while we recognize the need for peace we recognize the uh, the 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 real difficulty the difficult position that the Palestinian people is in and the suffering of the Palestinian people, that we also want to stand up for our values and recognize what is right and what is wrong. And um, Israel has a right to exist, right to defend itself, and the attacks against it were horrendous. So we are going to make those statements and we'll be here together to do that. I, I really think it's the only way. I don't think that it is, it, it's, it doesn't do any good to try to um, 
get in the face of someone who has a different point of view. What we've spent a lot of time doing in our congregation over the last year is being in touch with our college students so that we can understand what they're going through on college campuses since that's really been the heart of it um, and let them know that they're not alone. And if we can all feel that way too, I think we'll have done something important. And I think to add into that is that it is also, it's college students, but it's also I've heard from parents of kids of all ages and then also adults too who used to have spaces that were safe and comfortable for them but that don't feel that way anymore. So I think the first thing is just acknowledge how hard this year has been. It has been so hard and it remains hard. Spoiler, talking about that on Yom Kippur, so just so you know. But really, it's been really, really hard. So I think the first thing is just to acknowledge that, and that is real, and to talk to each other about that. The other thing I would encourage you to, and again, this is preaching to the crier, but you're here, show up, come to classes, come to Shabbat, come to things here, just to prove that Judaism is still thriving. We are here, we are surviving, we are celebrating. Um, I think in some ways that is uh, resistance too, and really, great resistance, but also find the joy, you know, services were really fun tonight, we had so much joy in it, that Judaism, as we resist, it doesn't have to be all dour, we can also really lean into the joy which Judaism brings to our lives as well, and I think also, and also remember that this is not universal, you know, I don't know about you, but I've had so many texts from people of all faiths wishing me Shana Tova and wishing good wishes to my family. So I think also sometimes we put everyone else into a different category that everyone is against us, but that is not true. And remember that we do have, I know I am, and I know many of you have relationships with people of all sorts of different faiths. And at the end of the day, most of us all just want peace and we all want the same things. And to keep that in mind uh, when the times are tough. Thank you. I'm going yeah. to uh, I'm going to lean into a dvar acher, which is a, a differing opinion here. Okay, what can we do? Um, what I have chosen to do is read, read as much as you possibly can of what they are reading. Become informed, a hundred and ten percent, on the differing opinion, because it is not until you understand what is forcing people to act and, and engage in what they are doing. It's not until you deeply understand that that you will know how to combat it. So the, mor the, the moral clarity is so apparent the minute you take a deep dive into that world. Dive in and get yourself a real understanding because the defense mechanism that we need to engage in is a very clear offense of what it is with morality, right? This is this is not um, this is not Israel's war. It's not. Israel is the first front, right? So I think um, that for me personally, becoming highly informed, so that when I engage with someone, I can do so respectfully and extreme in an extremely educated way that can mm. say, actually, I understand that you've read that, but let me just clarify why you're incorrect you're in this. You're saying that the first front is Israel, but that it's a war against the West it is. and America. It is, yeah. yeah. I mean, they've like when people tell you who they are, believe them. Like, how many times do we have to be told that this is a war against yeah. the West? It's very clear. So, um, and, and Israel is, is <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the only thing standing between them and us right now. So I think... Um, I think it's, it's, it's really important to read everything you can, watch everything you can, um, maybe not during the 10 days of all, let's, you know, <laughs> let's cleanse our souls a little bit, but, but just be, be prepared and be educated. Be the most educated voice at the table, right? Because then you're not just talking like you are, you have moral clarity and no one else does. You are speaking from an extremely informed opinion and you can explain why everything that has been fed has, has come from certain places. You know, I, I think uh, the more we know and the more we can share, the more we have access to quickly um, is going to help us. There was a fascinating article in the National Post this morning, um, which is a, a Canadian newspaper, about Canada's Jews and whether or not they should flee. And they are talking to their rabbis about how do we know when it's time, right? 
in Eastern Europe, there were those who got out and those who didn't. How did they know it was time? And Canada, Canadian Jews are having these conversations on a daily basis. Um, and so I think the more we, the more we read and the more prepared we are to combat misinformation with informed um, clarity is, uh, I think it's extremely important. I think this is, this is the, the war of our lifetime. Sorry, yeah. but I do. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, and, and thank you for the questions, the engagement.